in the pre-socialization stage are part of the development. We mean that by definition, infants are not yet cognitively developed to be socialized. They will exhibit those sex-specific preferences. So already that serves as a first name to the idea that it's all sort of arbitrary socialization. If you look at a disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endo endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls, what do you think happens to girls who suffer from that disorder? Their toy preferences become similar to those of little boys. Again, suggesting that there might be a hormonal drivers to this particular consumer preference. Rhesus and Zulus monkeys exhibit roughly the same sex-specific preferences as infants, as human infants do. This is, by the way, my daughter uh, when she was of that age, and they're actually sitting out there, but they can't come in because we have unruly children and they might cause a bit of high guys. And then there is also what's called a digit ratio. Digit ratio is the ratio of your index to ring finger. That's a sexually dimorphic trait whereby men usually have longer ring fingers than index fingers, and women have the more similar in men. Why is that relevant from a hormonal perspective? It turns out to be a putative marker of how much uh, hormones you've been exposed to, testosterone in particular, in utero. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenotypic marker of masculinization. Well, little boys who have more masculinized digit ratio have then more masculinized play behavior. So if you look at all this collection of findings, you come to the undeniable conclusion that, of course, culture matters, and of course, the environment matters, but certainly biology also has to do something with it. Now, this is probably not a difficult claim for people in this room to, to accept, but you really can't imagine in the social sciences how much hostility you receive for arguing that biology matters for anything short of your genitalia. Some of you may not know much about evolutionary psychology, so let me spend maybe three or four minutes giving you a very quick primer. You may know about evolutionary health, but not necessarily about evolutionary psychology. So evolutionary psychology basically argues that the mind is a product of natural and sexual selection. That's not very difficult to understand. It can't be that uh, all our other organs are prone to these dual forces of evolution, but somehow evolution stops at the neck. The next one is really important, what's called the domain-specific view of the human mind. So evolution psychologists argue that our brains are an amalgamation of computational systems, each of which has evolved to solve a specific adaptive problem. Find meat, retain meat, invest in kin, avoid predators, find nutritional food sources, uh, invest in reciprocal arrangements with friends. So each of these evolutionarily important problems would have led to specific computational systems in our brain. Learning, culture, and socialization, which is sort of the catch-all explanations in the social sciences, really explain very little. Why do women prefer tall men? Well, it's due to socialization. Why do men prefer young, younger women? It's due to socialization. But the question that still needs to be asked is why would socialization be of that form around the world across time periods? Of course, the mind is not an empty slate. And the next one, some of you may be familiar with it, uh, this epistemological difference. Others may not be, so let me spend a few minutes talking about it. So the importance of proximate versus ultimate explanations. Much of science operates at the proximate level. Nothing wrong with that. Most Nobel Prizes are won at the proximate level. The ultimate level, though, is the ultimate Darwinian why. Proximate looks at the what, the how factors. Ultimate is why would it have evolved to be of that form? So since we are here at an ancestral health conference, this is a particularly apropos example, pregnancy sickness, right? There are all sorts of proximate explanations or phenomena that I could study relating to pregnancy sickness. How do fluctuating uh, rates of, of a woman's hormone levels affect the severity of her pregnancy symptom, uh, sickness symptoms? That's a phenomenally appropriate proximate explanation or question to ask. The ultimate explanation is, why would women have evolved that physiological reality? And it turns out it happens during the first trimester, during a period called organogenesis, where the fetus is developing its key organs. And so it's particularly important during that period that a woman not be exposed to teratogens, food pathogens. And so the feelings of nausea, throwing up, aversions towards certain foods, attraction towards other types of foods, 
all of these realities are an adaptive solution to a very important evolutionary problem. So it's not that the ultimate explanation supplants the proximate explanation, it's not better, it's not superior, it's not ultimate in that sense, it's that you need both levels of explanations to really understand the phenomenon. And so what I do in my conservative behavior work is I introduce these ultimate level explanations to understand our concerning instinct. So let me give you some examples. First, let me spend a minute or two putting out of the way. Some of you probably have heard that all oh, evolutionary psychology is just a bunch of just, just so storytelling. You come up with some cute story, and uh, yeah, sure, you can make anything fit to anything. Nothing could be further than the truth from the truth. The evidentiary threshold that typically evolutionists go through in testing a hypothesis is astonishingly higher than in other disciplines. So let me give you just one example. The idea that men have a waist to hip ratio preference of roughly 0.7 which can slightly change depending on the ecological niches, the, the traditional hourglass figure. Well, it's been tested using line of, of uh, figure drawings in endless cultures. You could do a content analysis of Indian, African, Greek, Egyptian art spanning several millennia and calculate the waist to hip ratio of the statues that are represented in those different arts. You could do fMRI studies to see which parts of men's brain light up the most, depending on which images you see. Here's a study that I did a few years ago, where I coded the waist to hip ratio that uh, female escorts uh, advertise online for their services. You know, my name is Jenny, I'm a 36, 24, 36, call me, here's my phone number. Uh, well, the internet, of course, affords you the possibility to collect data from many, many cultures very quickly. And so I think it was 48 different cultures that had been content analyzed. By the way, the research assistant who had done the study for me uh, is still in love with me for having given him the opportunity to spend that summer surfing porno sites uh, doing this. He, he recently actually sent me a Facebook friend request. I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to accept it or not. Uh, you could do pre- and post-operative analyses, and usually the post-operative analyses are always trying to mimic as closely as possible the, the cues of mobility and fertility, right? There's no culture where a woman goes in and says, please do a plastic surgery to make me look much older than I really am, okay? Now, if that still hasn't convinced you, congenitally blind men, men who are born blind, so by definition, they could not have been socialized by sexist Hollywood, by sexist opera media. Yet, guess what? Haptically, by touch, they arrive to the exact same preference of 0.7. So if you put all of these findings together, it would be astonishing to argue that it's just a bunch of just so storytelling, that it's a bunch of nonsense. It's actually extraordinarily more rigorous than most other disciplines, certainly the behavioral sciences. So having gotten that out of the way, so what I basically do in my work, and I'll probably spend the rest of today's talk doing, is showing you how we could map much of consumer behavior onto one of four key Darwinian modules. The survival module, reproduction, mating, kin selection, which relates to, for example, why you would, why you would jump into a river to save your brothers, and reciprocity, which relates to non kin investments. Why would I jump into a river to save a friend or a stranger? And so I will give a few examples of consumer behaviors that map onto each of these different modules. So let's start with the first one, survival. So the hummingbird has a metabolic rate such that he has to eat 1.5 to 3 times its body weight just to survive to the next day. Well, we don't have that metabolic rate, yet we still have the penchant to gorge on all the pain buffets, right? And so here, of course, these ideas, you, oh, most of you would understand them, so I won't spend much time on them. Now, how would this sort of variety affect the idea that there's so much different variety of foods at a buffet manifest itself uh, in, in peculiar ways, in perhaps what we would consider irrational ways? If you take M&Ms of one color, or fewer colors, or M&Ms of multicolors, you put the exact same amount of M&Ms in two bowls, and you ask people to eat as much as they want from one or the other, they end up eating a lot more from the one that has multicolored MNMs, even though objectively, rationally, the, the coloring is odorless and tasteless. It doesn't change in any way your sensorial experience. 
but it is tricking my visual system into holding more because it, I'm succumbing to the variety effect. Similar principle, you take one, one shaped uh, pasta versus multi shaped pasta, people will gorge a lot more in this offer than the other one. Okay, so, here's an example where, in a sense, you are behaving quite irrationally because a cue that really shouldn't affect your, your gorging potential does end up affecting it. This I won't spend much time on because I think everybody in this room is familiar with If you look at the top 10 restaurants, or what they have in common from a marketing perspective, since I am housed in a consumer behavior department, is that they all do one thing very well and they offer us foods that are tasty and very fatty, right? And if you opened a, a, all you, uh, if you opened a, a McDonald's version that says all you can eat uh, grass or celery, it's probably not going to work as well. Even if you had Justin Timberlake singing uh, for the next 300 years, it's not going to work very well because it's not congruent with my above taste buds. I think everybody in this room would uh, agree with that. But the next slide is actually quite interesting because this, this slide talks about how cross-cultural differences might also be uh, subsumed, if you like, within an evolutionary framework. So there's a field called Darwinian gastronomy. Yes, there is such a field. Uh, developed by Paul Sherman, a neuroscientist at Cornell, where he looked at how culinary traditions evolve in different cultures as an adaptation to a real biological problem. So if you're a cultural and a psychologist, a psychologist or anthropologist, you would simply level at identifying cross-cultural differences. The Malaysians do it this way, the French do it that way. But what's more important probably is to study why these cultural differences would evolve. So it turns out that how much meat-based dishes there is in a culture, how much vegetable-based, how much spices you use, how much salt you consume, how much pickling you use, all turns out to be an adaptive solution to a very real problem of how much pathogens there is in that local environment, that local niche. It's called the antimicrobial hypothesis. And so in cultures where there's greater pathogenic density, you're going to have greater use of spices. And even within one, cult, one country, for example, in the US or India or China, big countries, depending on whether you're north or south, the spice index, if you'd like, will shift accordingly. So here's an example of how you would use evolutionary principles to not only explain human universals, but to also explain cross-cultural differences. Uh, moving on very quickly to mating, second module. Does anybody know what is the species of bird? Anybody? It's, sorry? No, but th thanks for the guess. It's a red-capped mannequin. What he does very well is he dances to impress the ladies. And the one who dances the best in a wreck is the one who gets to mate with all the ladies. Now, of course, in the human context, we have an analogous behavior where males will also engage in similar behaviors, right? So these are called ana analogies or, or homologies, depending on, uh, we, don't, we don't have to go into it here. Uh, here's a um, satin bowerbird who creates this uh, bower not for any functional purpose. He's not creating it because it's a nest uh, or to protect its young. It's an artistic expression. Voila, look what I've created for you. And if you think that I am artistic enough, then please mate with me. And of course, humans build these architectural structures also as sexual signals, right? Uh, you don't need 73 bedrooms uh, unless you have that many people in your family. But boy, does it serve as an honest signal of my social status. And so I'll, I'll discuss in a second a few examples of how we apply these principles from, uh, the, from sexual selection in consumer behavior. Uh, very, very quickly, these are some of the products that have been studied from an evolutionary perspective. If any of you are interested in hearing more about them, maybe you could intercept me later at the conference. I, don't, I probably don't have time to go through them, but perfume, flowers. Uh, Jeffrey Miller, who's next, will probably talk about this study since he's the one who uh, authored it. Uh, so I'll just whet your appetite by, by simply saying that there are quite a few products that have been now studied via an evolutionary lens, typically not by marketing scholars, by people in other disciplines. So let me discuss some of my own studies. So of course here we've got the peacock, the proverbial example in sexual selection, but there are many other examples trying to impress the hen, she's pretending she's not interested. So I took this idea and tried to see whether I could apply it in a consumer behavior context. Now, we all know just anecdotally that uh, 
men uh, have the penchant to purchase luxury cars, at least sports cars. There is no culture that's ever been uncovered where women are more likely to engage in the behavior. Typically, for example, Ferrari owners are 99% male. Even though there are endless number of women who certainly don't have a goal with the entry, they certainly have the money. There are tons of millionaire and billionaire women that can certainly go and, aff and afford any of these cars, yet they don't line up at the Aston Martin dealership. And so one argument is that <laughs> these cars serve as a form of pickpocketing. And so taking this idea, I wanted to actually test it endocrinologically. I wanted to see, uh, we know that when two males fight in many species, the one who wins has a rise in testosterone level. The one who loses has a drop in testosterone level. So taking this exact idea, I thought, let's see if we can bring people into the lab and then have them drive a fancy Porsche, not to, as you see in many psychology experiments, imagine yourself driving a Porsche. We actually rented a Porsche. And as some of you have seen some of my TED Talks might remember, uh, I, I mentioned there that uh, try to get a granting agency to rent you a Porsche for the weekend and you're saying, no, no, trust me, it's for scientific purposes. So we went to the Porsche and had this beaten up car and we had the same man drive both cars in one of two environments, either in a lecking environment, everybody can see me downtown Montreal, Friday after Friday night, or on a semi-deserted highway. And after each of the conditions, we collected salivary assays to measure eventually the fluctuating rates of testosterone. I won't get into the whole story. If you're interested, I can send you a copy of the paper. But you put young males in this car, and basically the endocrinological system explodes. And it doesn't explode as some reviewers at one point had pointed out. Oh, well, it's just because we're driving fast, and so it's a form of excitement, which, by the way, could be related more to cortisol. But at downtown Montreal, it's bumper to bumper. It's like a parking lot. So you're certainly not driving fast. But you are infusing me immediately with very high social status. Uh, my endocrinological system is going to respond accordingly. So this is one example of trying to marry uh, endocrino endocrinology with <laughs> consumer behavior. Now here's a study by some British colleagues where they had the same guy either sit in a Ford Fiesta or a Bentley and then the same woman in the same two cars and it's opposite sex ratings. You ask men to rate the women, you ask women to rate the men. Well, men couldn't give a damn which car the woman was in. On the other hand, I'm looking at, I think I've got about 20 minutes left, I hope. Uh, on the other hand, this guy was very unattractive, and this guy was as good looking as Brad Pitt. It's the exact same guy, right? And so again, the idea is that you associate cues of status to men uh, that does a lot to how women perceive his morphology. So in a sense, that's quite irrational because his face didn't change. So taking this idea a bit further, let me give you a background. This is a study that we're currently, I'm currently working on with my former doctoral students. There's a study that was done in the late 60s where you had the same man come into a room, let's say like this room, and you, you introduce him in one of several ways. In condition one, He's, he's a graduate student. In condition two, he's a lecturer. In condition three, he's a famous professor. Then he leaves, and then the people are asked a whole bunch of questions about the guy, one of which is, how tall was the guy? Boy, does status add height to you. This is why you all think I'm six foot five. Uh, so taking this idea, I thought, let's see if we could in a sense, replicate this by associating rather than academic titles to, to the same man, different cars of, I mean, products of different status. So we, we developed an online dating profile, exact same thing. This, this is my favorite uh, possession that I own. This is my favorite possession that I own. Some cheap Kia versus some expensive Porsche. And then we ask people, you know, how far did you think he was and so on. Now, interestingly, for men, what do you think, how do they rate this guy as a, as a function of the two cars? He's shorter. He's shorter than them. Women rate him taller. Exactly what you would expect, right? Men 
denigrate other men who have high social status. In this case, they literally denigrate his morphology, since we know that all other things equal, taller guys are preferred than shorter guys. Uh, luckily, I was able to convince my wife that I could still be a good genetic prospect despite being five foot six. So this is exactly what this study finds. Now I won't go through the rest, the next one, but here we look at you know how attractive he is and so on. Well, for example, how many sexual partners do you think he has? The guy who drives a Porsche is perceived as a philander, you know, a guy who would cheat, a guy who had many partners, and so on and so forth. I won't go through all this. The study's still being written up, but this shows you how just associating the same guy to different products, people end up with completely different evaluations and attributions of him. Uh, very, very quickly, this is a study done by a consulting firm where they, where they counted the number of brand mentions in songs, right? Uh, cultural products are a wonderful place to study the evolution of the human mind because they serve as fossils of the human mind, right? Literature, religious narrative, songs, soap opera themes. This is where all the good, juicy, universal themes that we consistently find throughout history are, are to be found. And song lyrics are a wonderful medium because in a sense, especially in hip-hop songs, all the political correctness is kind of taken away and only the raw expression is left. And so if you do a content analysis of brand mentions, uh, hey girl, I've got the Maserati, come get with me, uh, it's, all, it's almost always men, never female singers, who engage in that form of conspicuous consumption. Uh, and it's usually fancy luxury cars, just to kind of finish the point about cars. Just so that you don't think that it's only men who engage in sexual signaling, but I think you already know that, women too engage in sexual signaling, although they might use different cues to also ameliorate their lot in the multi market. So in the case of women, we did a study recently with one of my current doctoral students, Eric Stenstrom, where we looked at what happens to women's food consumption, which I won't talk about here, and beautification practices as a function of where they are in their menstrual cycles. The idea being, of course, that there are all sorts of hormonal cascades of hormones that wax and wane across the menstrual cycle, and these ultimately serve as adaptive solutions to important Darwinian problems. Well, probably everyone in this room can predict what, what, which part of the menstrual cycle do you think women are most likely to dress like this? When they're ovulating, right? When they're maximum short down, that's exactly what we find. What was, in, what was particularly interesting about our study is that we actually followed women for 35 contiguous days. Typically, these types of studies are done at two time periods, a non fertile phase and a fertile phase. Whereas we actually had data from every single day. And why 35 days? The typical menstrual cycle length is about 28 days. So by going 35 days, you're certainly making sure that most women would fit within that range. And so we got some really fantastic findings, which of course you couldn't have been able to tackle had you not been coming from an evolutionary perspective. Moving on, so I talked a bit about survival module, a bit about the mating module. Let me now move on to the kin selection module and the reciprocity module. Gift giving is a wonderful up place where you could study these kin relationships and these uh, reciprocal relationships because they serve as a prototypical place where these investments are made. I invite you on your birthday and hopefully you reciprocate and invite me on mine. So I won't, I won't go through these analysis here. By the way, this is, uh, me either just before getting circumcised or just after getting circumcised. Uh, I'm not sure which one it was. So let me, let me discuss some gift giving examples. No, no. I started later. Was, uh, 10, okay, let, let's go 10. Uh, so, so this is, this might be the first time that I overrule a guy who gives me a prompt. Sorry about that. I, I'll try to go as quickly as possible. Um, so we did a study recently where we looked at uh, gift giving practices at Israeli weddings. We wanted to look at specifically whether the genetic relatedness between the giver and the recipients would be, would determine the size of the gift. And then a second question, which I'll leave for a second. So hold, hold on. So the first thing, uh, by the way, in Israeli weddings typically, People don't give toasters and uh, you know uh, coffee machines. Instead, they just give money. And so the, the the bride and groom keep a list of who gave what. And so we actually had access to 30 of these lists. And so the, the analysis is based on that. So the first thing that we found is that 
this is this, this is a coefficient of genetic relatedness. So, for example, you and your siblings or you and your parents, on average, share 50% of your genes. This is you and your grandparents or your uncles and aunts, 25% of your genes. This is your first cousins. This is your second cousins. Without getting into too much details, the size of the bar is the, the monetary. People who are more close to you give you bigger gifts than people who are further from you. You might say, okay, well, I could have probably predicted that without knowing anything about evolutionary theory and genetic relatedness. Fair enough. The next finding, though, would have been a bit more difficult for you to predict. So if you look at your grandparents, I think uh, Nassim Talib mentioned very quickly a grandmother example. If you look at your four grandparents, on, on average, they all have the same genetic relatedness to you. 25% of their genes. But if you realize that it's not just genetic relatedness that matters, but genetic assuredness, right, then it changes the story. Your maternal grandmother is assured of her genetic lineage to you. There is no such thing as maternal uncertainty. Your paternal grandfather has two generations of maternity uncertainty. So we would expect the maternal grandmother to invest the most, the paternal grandfather to invest the least, and the two other grandparents to be in the middle. And several studies across many cultures have exactly found that. So we took this idea and we said, well, let's see if we could get this matrilineal effect when it comes to gift giving. And that's exactly what we got. The matrilineal side of the brides and groom gave much, much larger gifts than the, patri the, the father's side. So that one would have been more difficult for you to predict had you not been coming with an, from an evolutionary lens. Let's move on very quickly. I always tell people that one of the things that I love about evolutionary theory is that it allows us to navigate through life and identify things that happen in our daily lives from an, from an evolutionary lens. So let me give you one from my own personal life. Uh, my, my daughter is not here right now. This is the ultrasound of our daughter in utero, you know, during the first trimester. As most parents do, you typically put it up very proudly on your fridge to show that, hey, look, we are fertile, we've produced our first child. Now, of course, if you look at this image, it could be that of an extraterrestrial, it could be an amoeba, it could be a jelly. Uh, however, my mother-in-law stopped her and arrestingly stated, oh my God, God, the baby looks exactly like you. He's got your profile. Now, why do I give this example? Because it actually demonstrates something fundamentally important, and that is, this is, if you like, the ancestral way of DNA paternity testing. This is the cultural way by which the mother's side of the family assuaged the fears of the father that it is his child. But typically, this happens after you give birth. When a baby is born, then everybody says, especially the mother's side, oh my God, he looks exactly like you, Tony, which objectively can be right. But this was the first time that I've demonstrated this in utero, and I always tell my daughter that I have permanently made her famous in the annals of science. I should probably write a one-page letter somewhere and publish it. I won't go through the rest of the stuff here because I guess we're running out of time. And let me just really quickly go through a few other examples. So future discounting is something uh, in actually in relative rationality that looks at whether you are an immediate gratifier or delayed. You're willing to postpone rewards. Do you want to receive $100 now or wait a week and receive $130 later? And it's correlated with the personality trait that we have. Are you, as I said, an immediate gratifier or a delayed gratifier? It turns out, though, that if you prime people with certain biologically relevant cues, they will alter their behavior in terms of their intertemporal choice. So if you give people a sugary drink or not, that changes what's called the lambda parameter. They become more future-oriented because they actually have a satiety cue. If you show men a gorgeous woman, what do you think happens to their intertemporal discounting? They want it now, right? So one of the potent forces in nature is men's sexual drive, and so when you cue men with photos of, you so say you cue basically the Newton drive, they actually alter their intertemporal choice behavior. This doesn't apply if you put a gorgeous guy and show it to women. Women don't succumb to the same cues. Uh, let me very, very quickly go over this. So this is, this is actually my daughter, this is my son. So I'm currently doing a study with one of my, my that same doctoral student, where we're looking at what happens if you prime people with photos, or either photos or sounds of babies laughing and crying, and how does that affect their conspicuous consumption, their risk taking, and so on. You might say, well, what, who cares about babies? Why are you priming this? Well, we know that expectant fathers, when they're about to have a child, what do you think happens to their testosterone levels? 
it goes down. Now, why does that happen? To the extent that you have eaten most of the day, but now I have to stop thinking about anything and actually shift my orientation to parenting. Well, a great way to do it is to have reduced libido of life, right? And the way you do that is by reducing your testosterone. So using the exact same idea, we thought that by simply priming people with photos of babies or sounds of babies, that would affect their risk-taking behavior, their conspicuous consumption, and so on. And the preliminary findings, we haven't yet finalized the studies uh, or, and all the collected all the data, but the preliminary stuff looks pretty good. So just to kind of whet your appetite. Uh, I think I'm going to have to skip this. How much, how much time do you think I have? Two minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to skip this, although it's fantastic. It deals with pornography and sperm competition. Ask me about it later at lunch. Uh, I might have to also skip this because we're running out of time. Uh, so let me maybe end. The, I have two slides left. I'm trying to go as quickly as I can, but I really would have loved to talk about those other slides. Um, J.B.S. Haldane was a famous evolutionary scientist who not only was famous for his science, but was an incredibly quotable guy because he had all these you know, sarcastic quips and observations about daily life. This is probably my favorite one of his, uh, in part because it really captures my own scientific career. So he said that when scientists are exposed to a new radical theory, and I think Nassim Taleb would appreciate this because he's certainly uh, at times introduced ideas that a lot of people were hostile to. When, when scientists are exposed to a new idea, they go through four stages of acceptance. So stage one, uh, this is this is baloney. This is worthless nonsense. As the paradigm starts picking up steam, well, yeah, this is interesting, but a rather perverse point of view. As more evidence comes in for the paradigm, well, this is true, but who cares? This is largely unimportant. And then when the paradigmatic walls fall, you get the emails that say, oh, I always thought your work was great, right? But I remember that eight years ago, you told me that my work was worthless nonsense, right? So I think that's really persistence. Uh, so in my case, the fact that I was introducing, you know, these biological principles of the consumer behavior at first was quite heretical, but now there's a group of really, really bright folks that are working at that intersection. And I, I think it won't be long before this is basically normal science. Yes, of course, consumers are driven by evolutionary forces. How? What else could it be? So to conclude, I think the first speaker said that it's, it's a requisite to always have Dobzhansky, so he beat me to the punch. Uh, Dobzhansky said nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and I propose that nothing in CB, consumer behavior, makes sense in light of, the, uh, in light of evolution. I tried to contact my publishers to get them to bring some of the books. They weren't quite receptive. Maybe you could edit that out of the, the talk. Uh, so there might be there might be a few copies that I bought that were either personal copies or send and so on. Uh, I hope that you'll check them out. Thank you so much for your attention.